everyone um, for another day full of lectures. I hope you still have the stamina. <laughs> um, so today I resume lectures that are part of the very first PowerPoint slides that I presented. You may recall that in the first lecture we didn't finish it all. And so now here we are on page 64 of the very first slide on introduction to WGCNA. So the topic today will be module preservation statistics. And um, module preservation is often an essential step in a network analysis. You may recall it is actually step number four in the typical uh, stepwise um, progression of the analysis. So remember, we wanted to assess and study the module preservation or conservation across different data for two types of reasons. One reason is to check the robustness of our modules. For example, if we have one cortical gene expression data set and we find our modules, we want to see, well, are they preserved in a second data set, possibly measured on a different platform. Your first data set may have involved um, Affymetrix array and the second platform um, comes from RNA-seq studies, you know, and you want to see is my module preserved, meaning biologically meaningful, as opposed to some sort of artifact. But also, we are very much care about studying modules in different conditions, you know. You may ask which module that is um, present in the cortex is also present in the cerebellum. You know? And Today I will talk about um, results that come from a first author paper by Peter Langfelder entitled with, Is my network module preserved and reproducible? And before I delve into the statistics, let me um, give you a motivational example. So this comes again from a paper from Mike Oldham in PNAS. And so here um, we um, or Mike um, analyzed gene expression data from human brain samples and also from chimpanzee brain samples. And on the left panel, the, you see a dendrogram. And this dendrogram corresponds, of course, to the modules that were found in the human brain. And you see right underneath the, these um, branches, you see the color assignment, the module assignment. On the right-hand side, you see the analogous plot for chimpanzee brains. And, um, but be, be very careful now about the color assignment. Notice the very first color band underneath the chimpanzee network um, shows actually the human module colors, okay? <laughs> right, you imagine you have the chimpanzee genes, you can just assign a color to each of these genes based on the human modules. But the second color band actually shows the module color for the chimpanzee brains. And you notice it's much clearer, right? There's no fuzziness. Why? Because it's branch cutting, you know. Um, but just um, correspondingly, going back to the human data, there are also um, two color bands. The very first row shows the human module assignment, and the second row shows the corresponding assignment from the chimpanzee tree. And just looking at it, we see, well, there's a lot of turquoise genes that are overlapping. You know? Similarly, yellow overlaps to a lesser extent, brown, and so on. So when you have two module assignments, um, you can, of course, cross-tabulate them, right? So here, for example, are the modules from the human brain. Here, the columns represent the modules from the chimpanzee brain. And the entries of this table show the number of overlapping genes. And underneath it, we see a hypergeometric test p-value. And so let's look at some of these findings. So for the turquoise human brain and the turquoise chimpanzee brain, we find that there are 747 overlapping genes. And um, in the human turquoise modules, there were a total of 1,001 genes. So 747 of them agree with in the chimpanzee module assignment. Yes? Hi, 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 Hi. 
you deal with the Orthodox? Because sometimes yes. the same gene is doing the same thing, but it's different name. Yes. Different so the species. yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with the Orthodox? You know. Yeah. At this point, we kind of ignored it, you know, as long as we could match genes, you know. And so, but to be very more precise, so these um, were affymetrics data. And so somebody went through, not um, I, the original authors of the data set actually went through the exercise of removing affymetrics probes that um, did not show sequence preservation between the two species. So they only looked at pr probes that had. Um, um, corresponding sequence re regions. And then, of course, they aggregated by gene, you know. Yeah. All right. So, but let's think about this analysis now. Imagine there had been a module, let's say purple module, that was only present in human brain samples, but not in chimpanzee brain samples, you know. In principle, that would be a very exciting module, right? Because we would say, there's this module that can only be found in human brains, but not in chimpanzees. And maybe that's the module that explains why we're so much sharper, you know. And <laughs> but statistically, we would have a little problem, which is a reviewer would say, well, the reason why you didn't find the purple module in the chimpanzee data is because you used the wrong soft threshold. You shouldn't have used a soft threshold of six. You should have used a soft threshold of nine. Or they would say, you didn't do the branch cutting right. Here you used the static branch cutting method. If only you had used dynamic branch cutting, you would find it. You know. So there's a problem to argue that a module is not preserved. You know, And, and that is... Um, probably the number one disadvantage of these cross-tabulation-based analyses of module preservation. So they're ill-suited for making strong statements that a module is not preserved. And therefore, we developed network-based approaches, really statistical approaches, that would free us up from that criticism. So I will show you statistics that are that are really a number for each module. And this, what will happen will be, it, um, you will get a number for the, let's say this purple module. And if that module, uh, number is below a threshold, it means no matter how you do branch cutting, you will never find this module. That's where we are heading. All right, so, but here we take a very broad definition of the meaning of a module, a very abstract definition. So we simply call it a subset of nodes in a network, right? Remember, when we do branch cutting or clustering, a module is a cluster of, of genes. We no longer impose it. Any set of genes could be a module. And as an example, it could be a Keck pathway, all the genes in one pathway, or a Go ontology category. Example, the set of all apoptosis-related genes could be interpreted as a module. And then what we will do is we will um, evaluate whether a given module that is defined in one data set, let's say the human data, can be found in another data set. That, and that's what's known as the test network. So we start with the reference network where we define the module and then evaluate it, it, the preservation of these modules in a test network. So here I give you an um, intuition. Here I consider the module of all apoptosis-related genes. And so they basically come from a Keck pathway, you know. It, 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 these genes were not found through a cluster analysis. And we combine the genes according to the correlation among them. A red line means a strong positive correlation, a green line shows a strong negative correlation. And the left panel shows the connectivity pattern between the apoptosis genes in the human brain data, and the right-hand side shows the same thing in chimpanzee brain data. And what we learned, I mean, just looking at it, I hope you see there's very little preservation, right? I don't see preservation of these patterns. And um, and so, in essence, what we want is we want statistics 
that tell us that, that tell us, well, there's very poor similarity between these two um, networks. So we need, and so when you have statistics that measure the properties of a network, they are called network statistics or they are called network concepts. In any event, the most famous network statistic you already know, it's just the node connectivity, right? So the connectivity of the ith gene is just the sum of the adjacencies with all the other genes. In other words, the number of frames. Um, but another statistic that we haven't talked about yet is called density. And in certain ways it measures how densely connected are all the genes inside a network. Mathematically, it's just defined as the average of the off-diagonal elements of the adjacency matrix. You know? Or another way, way of saying it, it's related to the mean connectivity. So, as I mentioned then, we have these network-based statistics based on adjacency matrices, and then when we want to study network or module preservation, we ask several questions. The first question is, is the density of the module um, preserved? You know? So in other words, let's say the apoptosis genes in the human brain samples have a high density, let's say 0.8. You can ask, do they have also a high density in the chimpanzee data set? If not, then maybe the module is not preserved. Another property that we evaluate when it comes to preservation statistics is the connectivity preservation. In essence, that assesses whether a gene that is a hub gene in the first network remains a hub gene in the second network. You know? right? So can connectivity preservation means genes that are highly connected in the first network are also highly connected in the second network. The third prob uh, property that one can assess for um, measuring module preservation is known as separability. Imagine you have two modules that are very distinct in the human brain, but in the chimpanzee brain they start to merge. They're no longer separate. Arguably you would say, well, maybe the, my original module is not really preserved. You know? And that's an intuitive property to assess, but it just turns out that it it is, in practice, that is a criterion that leads to trouble. And so, in reality, we mainly focus on assessing network density preservation and connectivity preservation. You know? So, it, we also, uh, we have an R function, which is known as module preservation. That's it, you know, that's it. And this R function outputs pretty much any statistic you can even think of, you know. <laughs> it drowns you in information. And so if you want to study separability, knock yourself out, you know. Yes. However, <laughs> I will say in practice um, when, and also in simulation studies, we found when you use that separability statistic, you often got findings that are biologically not meaningful or it, 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 they were counterintuitive, you know. In other words, there was, for example, we saw that the module was preserved in a dendrogram, but according to the statistic, it wasn't, you know, and then we said, come on, I mean, something isn't working right. So therefore, we focus on the first two. All right, now, coming back to module preservation, it can really be assessed in all <coughs> networks that you can think of. Any network specified by an adjacency matrix. Remember, an adjacency matrix is a symmetric matrix that encodes connectivity between nodes. So, example, you could have a protein-protein interaction network, and you can have modules in it. And you can ask, well, often modules correspond then, let's say, to protein complexes. You know, and you can ask, is this module preserved in another species? You could have protein-protein interaction in C. elegans and evaluate it in Drosophila. That works. And we have R software tutorials that show you how to, how to accomplish it. Having said this, of course, um, we, um, our focus here is on correlation networks. And the advantage is that these correlation networks give rise to particularly powerful statistics. And that 
highlights an advantage of weighted networks because um, the, the weight in a weighted network allows you to um, keep track of subtle changes. You, know? you, you just um, have more power than to pick things up. So let me give you some very intuitive um, statistics that measure connectivity preservation. Imagine I have my human brain module and I measure the intramodular connectivity of all the genes in that module in the reference set. Similarly, I have a measure of intramodular connectivity in the chimpanzee network, the test data. And so I just form the correlation across these connectivities, right? That's how we measure similarity or preservation of connectivity. It's a very intuitive statistic. Another statistic is the following. You, um, you take the adjacency matrix among these genes, you vectorize it. You turn the matrix into a vector. You do that for the human brain data, you do that for the chimpanzee brain data, you have two vectors and now you can correlate them. And that's what we call core dot adjacency. Other, so this is of course defined for any network, right? Any, these upper two statistics are defined for any network based on an adjacency matrix. However, when you have a correlation network, you have an underlying correlation matrix and therefore you can define this core dot core, right? So this is the correlation of the vectorized correlation matrices. And why is that statistic particularly powerful? Reason is it keeps track of sign information, right? <laughs> That's a great advantage. When two genes are negatively correlated in the human brain, you want to know, do they remain negatively correlated in the chimpanzee brain? All right. Similarly, when you have a correlation network, you have, of course, this measure of module membership, which we call KME. And similarly, you can form the correlation of these KME measures. Now, you notice already, here we have four different measures of connectivity preservation, and probably your head is spinning. And same here, you know. <laughs> That's... Um, but the, it turns out they're all very related with each other, you know. You can show that empirically, meaning if a module has high core dot intramodular connectivity, the same module also have a, has a very high core dot KME and the same, same core dot core. Why they all measure, in essence, similar things. And therefore, um, we, we wanted to get around endless discussions with reviewers, which measure is better, this or that, or this or that. And we say, we aggregate all of them into one composite measure. So, um, and that's done here. You know, in the end, what we will do is we define Z statistics for these uh, different measures. And then we form the median across these four measures. But let me um, go step by step to... Um, all right, so we have these four um, measures. And similarly, we also have four density measures. So we... Um, and um, they, every one of these measures is defined in a fashion so that the values are less than one. One always means perfect preservation. Going back, what is the highest core dot km that you can observe? Well, it's a correlation. Highest value is one. You know, everything here is a correlation. So, but yeah, but in any event, um, so we know what the maximum value is, but we don't have a good sense um, what is statistically significant. <coughs> what we need is thresholds, statistical significant thresholds. Why? Because um, these preservation statistics depend on the number of genes in the module the number of samples that were used to define the correlation matrix, surely the biology and platform and so on. So in order to define then significant thresholds, we use a staple, which is a permutation test. Right? And so the idea is very sim simple. You have your human brain network, you have the chimpanzee brain network, and what do you do? You simply reshuffle all the gene labels in the chimpanzee network. In other words, you completely break the connection between genes in the human network and those in the chimpanzee network. 
So then you have this permutation, and what, and then you can calculate a preservation statistic for that permuted scenario. And you can do this, of course, repeatedly. Let it, let's say you carry out 100 permutations. Every single time you get a module preservation statistic under the null hypothesis of no preservation. And then what you can do is you can form the mean across these preservation statistics. And similarly, the standard deviation of these preservation statistics. And then you can define a z-score, right? You take the original uh, module preservation statistic where you didn't permute the gene labels, subtract from it the mean and divide it by the standard deviation, and that will be a z-statistic. Okay. So some of you are serious statisticians, and you will probably wonder, why don't you do a true permutation test? You know, when you, have a per when you permute things thousands of times, you can calculate a permutation test p-value directly. You know? And, the, and you, calculating these statistics is in certain ways a roundabout way, because in certain ways you appeal to asymptotics. The answer is that these calculations are um, computationally intensive. Uh, um, when you do a hundred permutations, it, it could take an hour. You know? So for a permutation test, Ideally, we would want to do a billion or a million <laughs> permutations. Um, why? Because we care about p-values that are very significant. When we do module preservation, we get p-values 10 to the minus 100. And you, you calculate how long that will do, take to do a permutation test for that. You know? so, so therefore, we do this, um, we use that trick of using z-statistics. You know? Yes? Uh, Steve, sometimes when yeah. we do permutations in genetic situations where you have an admixed population, you have to be very careful not to not over-permute. In other words, when you do a permutation test, you're assuming that the items that you're permuting are in equal relations to one another. So now you have, you know that your, your array data set or whatever has a complex substructure, and I just wonder how you... Are you doing a hierarchical permutation that knows about the modules that you've discovered? So you permuting Yeah, no, equivalent? I don't. No, we just plain. So that'll always give you very optimistic p values because you're over commuting when you do this. Yeah, well, I mean, I embrace the criticism. I um, except for one thing <laughs> that in we evaluated it in uh, simulation <laughs> studies, you know. So it turns out. Um, if we applied true statistical theory to develop to derive right now thresholds, I would also be nervous about that aspect. But um, but the threshold choices that we choose are actually based on simulation studies, you know? and so I'm quite comfortable with the outcomes. And Peter worked on this for two years and every day simulated. I, so, <laughs> I feel sorry, so, but we trust the results, you know. <laughs> So, <clears throat> in any event, we get now a z-score that, um, for, remember, we have four connectivity statistics, we have four density statistics. For each one, we get a z-score. And so we have eight z-scores. In principle, every single z-score <coughs> lends itself for answering the question, is the module significantly better than a random sample? And if we have wanted to be smart, we would have written eight papers, one for each statistic, you know. <laughs> um, however, we felt this is a bit ridiculous, and therefore what we will do is we summarize these z-scores, you know. And so we, we have an, um, an aggregate or composite summary z-score, and now we have the thresholds. So if z-summary is less than two, we say the module is not preserved. Right, and it, it really means no matter how you cluster the data, it is not preserved. A z-score between two and 10 um, is often moderately preserved, and z-summary bigger than 10 always means strong evidence of preservation. Now, I need to tell you these are a bit flexible, these thresholds, because they depend to some extent on the module size, and I'll describe that, you know. So meaning, if you have a module comprised of a thousand genes, 
it's much more likely to get a Z summary less than 10 than if you have a module that has 100 genes, you know. And so, so, if, so as a data analyst, choose thresholds that reflect in certain ways the module sizes you get in your data set, you know. So if you have RNA-seq data, you get very large modules, then I'm very happy with these thresholds that are reported here. But if you have a, a very um, um, terse or sparse network, for example, from a consensus network analysis, suddenly I would probably lower the thresholds. Instead of 10, I would use 5 you know, yeah, for indicating strong preservation. All right, so I wanted to give um, some um, details then on how we define this Z summary score. So the Z summary score is a number for the Qth module. The superscript denotes which module you are dealing with. And it is this, the average of the connectivity-based um, Z statistic and the density-based Z statistics. And notice, so remember we started out with four statistics that measure connectivity preservation. So as I indicated, we form the median across the four Z statistics. Similarly, we have four statistics that measure density, for example, the mean correlation, the mean adjacency, the proportion of variance explained by the module eigengene, or the mean KME. And for each one of them, we get a Z statistic, and again, we form the median. And as I mentioned, we then form the average. So what does that statistic tell us then? It tells us if a module it has a high value for Z summary, more often than not, not only is the density highly preserved, but also the hub gene status is highly preserved. All right. So... Um, there is a little drawback of this statistic, which is it's computationally intensive, meaning it could take several hours to run. But the other drawback is that these Z statistics depend to some extent on the module size. And um, often uh, people are in a situation where smaller modules in their data are actually what they care about. Um, and therefore, we have defined an another composite statistic which does not require a permutation test and it also does not show a dependence on the module size. And um, it, it will take a couple of <coughs> minutes to calculate it. And this statistic is known as the median rank statistic. And um, as the name indicates, it's based on the rankings of the modules. So let's say you have your, um, the very first module preservation statistic and you have 10 modules. <coughs> that statistic allows you to say, well, this module is most highly preserved, rank 1. This is the least preserved, rank 10. Right? And so for each of these eight statistics, you get a ranking. And then you can um, in, um, summarize these rankings with the median similar to what was done here, you know. So you have four rankings based on the connectivity statistics. You form the median rank. Similarly, you have four rankings based on density statistics. You form the median, and then you um, average the medians. And you come up, uh, get this median rank. All right, so in conclusion then, we have um, two composite statistics. These are the statistics you see in our papers. Uh, the first name is called Z summary, which is based on a permutation test. And this allows you then to come up with significance um, values. As a matter of fact, our R function module preservation literally outputs a p value. Mm -hmm. The problem is these p values are so significant that we usually don't report them, we report Z statistics. Mm -hmm. If you have a Z statistic of 10, I don't know what the p-value is. I mean, um, somebody can tell me. You know. Remember, a Z statistic bigger than 2 means p-value 0.05. You know. <laughs> so Z statistic bigger than 10 is astronomically significant, but that's what we report. The disadvantage of Z summary is that it's computationally intensive and often depends on the module size. 
In contrast, the composite statistic median rank is fast and does not depend on module sizes. And so here I wanted to give you an example from the R software tutorial that we have, where we um, show, um, let's start with the right panel. The y-axis shows the z-summary statistic, the x-axis shows the module sizes, and every dot is a module. And you notice it's labeled by colors, of course. And um, this um, comes from an application where we wanted to assess whether modules that are present in female mouse livers are also present in male mouse livers, right? And so what we see is that actually most modules are above the threshold of 10, taught, uh, pre highly preserved. There's only one module that is not preserved. So this, in principle, we could now be very excited about this module. Maybe we have a gender-specific module in the liver that explains differences in metabolism <coughs> between females and males. Before we... Um, try to understand this module more, let's um, observe that actually there's a fairly strong dependence between module size on the x-axis and z-summary on the y-axis, right? And um, some people think of it as a, as a um, disadvantage, but it's a feature, it's not a bug, and <laughs> I want to explain that to you. <laughs> um, it, you want that to be the case, you know, and, and why is that? Imagine we have one module comprised of 500 genes. And what we observe is that the connectivity pattern be the, between these 500 genes is highly preserved. You know? So then you say, wow, this is impressive. So in other words, the core dot core statistic, let it be 0.8. You say, wow, that's highly preserved. Now, assume now the opposite end of the spectrum, there's a module that contains three genes. And so there are three edges between the two genes. And you say, look, the connectivity pattern is preserved. You know? <laughs> then you say, are you kidding me? This is, this is a statistical fluke. You know? In other words, if a module has only three genes and it shows connectivity preservation, it's much less statistically significant than if you observe such a thing in a large module. And therefore, you want it to be the case that, in, in general, there is a dependence on module size. All right. Now, but having said this, you could say, but look at it. This light green module is tiny. It looks like it has like about 20 genes, you know. What about if you applied this um, median rank statistic? So it turns out that this light green module has a ranking, I think it's 18 or so, um, it has a very high rank, meaning it's the least preserved according to the median rank statistic, right? According to the median rank statistic, the most highly preserved module is the light cyan module, which happens to be this module. You see, according to the z-summary statistic, this light cyan module has a z-summary value, let it be 28 or so. It's not as high as those of other modules, but given its relatively small size, it really stands out. You know? And so here we see that too. So coming now to the biologic story, so there's this light green module that is not preserved between genders, so can we write a good article about it? Before we write the paper, let's look at a heat map. And you've seen this module before, you know. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very a suspicious module. These are the genes, are the rows, the columns are the mice. And we see that um, the genes of this module are highly underexpressed in one single mouse liver tissue. And so chances are th this is a technical artifact or a tissue contamination. Maybe it isn't really female liver, anything, you know. But basically this module is not trustworthy. So I wanted to tell you that um, there is a book on weighted network analysis which um, describes uh, module statistics in great detail and all network statistics. So in this course, we are very applied, and I don't torture you with mathematics, but some of you are mathematicians. So if you really want to learn um, relationships between module statistics and um, 
network statistics. There are several chapters on it. Um, this book is often freely available from your library. If you are at a university, they have a subscription for Springer books, so you can download it for free. Um, I'm very sorry, it's actually quite expensive. It's maybe 160 or 170 dollars. It's not my fault. I really <laughs> pleaded with the editor, uh, with Springer, you know, but... All right, you know, of course, that we will post all of these lectures and videos on our workshop uh, web page, so just be aware of it. I'll briefly thank um, several collaborators, uh, for example, Jake Luces, Tom Drake, Especially Jake has contributed the data, and of course uh, Giovanni Coppola is another, and Dan Geshwind, Rule Ophoff, and above all Peter Langfelder. And um, I think what I will do now, I'll take your questions. Do you, uh, do you have any questions? Mm. Yes. Um, from the statistical framework view, does it matter which one is the reference for the test? So when you about yes. And yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, so the question is, um, when it comes to module preservation statistics, does it matter what is the um, reference set and what's the test set? And the answer is definitely it matters, you know. So let's say um, <clears throat> you need to write, uh, you need to decide how you want to write your paper. Let's say you start with a large human brain data set and then you find your modules. You, then you can evaluate which of the human modules is preserved. You know, That's one paper. Then half a year later, you say, well, why don't I write the opposite paper? So then, then you start with the chimpanzee brains. You find the modules, you characterize them, and ask which of them are preserved in the human data. I'm a bit facetious, but it's really probably a good idea to write two separate papers. Otherwise, you really review, uh, you confuse the reader, you know. Because if you have all these module colors floating around, they may have a hard time following things. But in some papers, we put it all together, you know, so. <laughs> but if you have two module assignments from humans and also from chimpanzee, you can do this cross-tabulation approach, you know, that I showed earlier. And that may be very intuitive to lots of readers. You know? But you would then want to line up the module colors. That's very important. Right, so um, coming back to this table, the cross-tabulation, sorry, the cross-tabulation table that I showed here. <clears throat> so notice, isn't it nice that the black module really corresponds to the black chimpanzee module, that the brown human module really corresponds to the brown chimpanzee module, you know. That's, of course, not a coincidence. We used the match labels function to line it up. Um, yeah, I do want to um, come up with a second answer to your question, <laughs> and because it is a segue for the next presentation, which is consensus modules. Imagine you have a totally different research question, which is which modules are preserved in primate brains, in many primate brains, human, chimpanzee, vervet, macaque, blah, blah, blah. So then you would say, well, why can't I put all the data together? get networks and find modules that are present in most of these brains. Then you are in the realm of consensus module analysis. You know? And um, pe people often confuse these two analyses because they are similar, right? In some shape or form, consensus module analysis looks for <laughs> modules that are preserved, quote unquote, in many data sets. You know? um, but strictly speaking, these are different analyses. Because the module preservation analysis really focuses on one reference set. And often the investigator wants to prove that there are distinct modules that are only present in human brain but not in mouse brain. You know? And then they really have to do module preservation analysis. Or also imagine you wrote your paper and the reviewer say, I just don't believe what you found. But fortunately, you find a new um, publicly available data set and you want to just convince the reader and the reviewer of your article my modules are robust. Suddenly you want a quote-unquote replication study. Then you want um, again module preservation analysis. Yes? Um, on slide 77 you referred to uh, vectorized um, correlation 
Oh, yeah, thanks for asking. All right, so let's say you have a correlation matrix, which is, of course, a square matrix. And the diagonal elements are all one. They're trivial. So what you would like to do is you want to turn this matrix into a vector, literally a, ve a, yeah, a column of numbers. So the way to do it is to use our R function, which is called vectorized matrix. <laughs> Input is a matrix, output is a vector. But um, to really then show it, you just use all the off-diagonal elements. But if you have a symmetric matrix, you don't duplicate them. And that's what is meant by... So yes. when you, use, you just you line up those from the first column and then the next part of the vector becomes... The yes. The yes. First the entries from the first column, then the next column underneath, then the next column underneath, and so on. That's a vectorized matrix, yeah. Right, we need to vectorize it, otherwise the core function doesn't work. The R function core requires a vector as input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions at this point? Or, it, yes? Can you just use the C summary? Yeah. Summary or median rank? Median rank, yeah. When, when do I do? Yeah, well... the. You know, I always, uh, in most situations, we take the Z summary statistic. And the reason is we want to convince the reader or the reviewer that the module is preserved. And in order to do it, in essence, you need a p-value, you know, which is equivalent to the Z summary statistic. Just be aware it's the same thing as a p-value. And you can just say, according to Z summary, the module, the cortical module is also preserved in the cerebellum because it's about, the threshold is 10. You know? um, so, in the, and for that purpose, we like Z summary. But um, there is, an, um, there is an, um, a drawback to it, which is that um, sometimes the Z summary statistic um, does not give meaningful results. You know? And why is that? You may be in a situation where, for example, um, there is a tiny module, 30, um, 30 genes, you know? and, uh, and, and that module is very strongly related to your disease of interest. You know? And then you... Um, but the, then the Z summary statistic may be four or so. It's just not impressive. But according to the median rank statistic, this module really stands out. Given its small sample size, it's actually ranking very highly. You know? And then um, I would really report both statistics in a paper. You know? I would literally have this discussion. I would say the WGCNA has two preservation statistics. Here we use the median rank statistic because we were interested in small modules, you know, and uh, they, in this sense, it's more meaningful. You know. All right, so before I end, I want to um, now have our quiz again, if you don't mind, you know. <laughs> so it's um, men against women, and I want to ask the following to the men. You have modules and you want to find a module that relates to disease status. How do you do it? You have 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep. <laughs> uh, you can compare a module eigengene to disease status. Exactly. If I want to find a module that's interesting, I have my branches, I get my module eigengenes, and I relate that module eigengene to disease status. Okay, what do you do if your collaborator gives you a data set that contains three types of brains? Healthy, normal brains, brains from schizophrenics, and brains from autistic subjects. And you want to find exciting modules. How do you do that? <laughs> the women. Dummy. Dummy variable. Okay, good. Yeah, so one um, approach is you have your clinical trait, three values, and you turn it into multiple clinical traits. You define one column called schizophrenia. And that 
takes values one for schizophrenic brains and zero for every other brain. Then you have another variable called autis autism. It takes on value for autistic brains and zero for all other brains. And a third column, healthy brain, one and zero. You know. Why do you do that? Because when you cluster, for example, uh, well, for example, when you create heat maps, you can correlate these dummy variables with your module eigengenes. That's one approach. But there's, of course, another approach, which is to use some sort of an analysis of variance, right? Or, um, um, so you take the module eigengene as the dependent variable, and then you relate it to three groups using an F-test, analysis of variance. You know? And that's perfectly fine. All right. How do you... Um, Let's say you have a complicated data set where you have your modules and it includes measures of, um, um, for example, gender is one, age, ethnicity, and also um, this um, RNA quality measures. And you want to find modules that relate to disease. <coughs> like, how do you go about that? Any thought? There are two strategies. One is, well, you form a multivariate regression model, right? You have a module eigengene, that's your dependent variable, and you regress it on age, RNA quality, batch effect, gender, and then, of course, disease status, you know? And if that um, disease status remains significantly associated after you correct for all the other variables, Arguably, this is an exciting module. You know. That's strategy one. That's usually what I do. Um, but there are people who are very smart and they do a sec another strategy. You know. And I'll just describe it for you. The alternative is to um, construct the network in a different way. So what you do is you take every single gene and regress it on these variables I mentioned. RNA quality, batch effect, gender, age. So you fit a multivariate model for each gene and you then get a residual, right? So you replace all of your expression data by residuals. And then you use these residuals as input of WGCNA and you find then modules, and hopefully modules that relate to disease. Mm -hmm. um, so both strategies work. Um, I'm not sure. What are your opinions? Does anybody have an idea what they prefer? Yeah. No, I, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So we went through this data cleaning. Yes. With, uh, and we talked about this combat. Yes. My understanding yes. is I can actually use this uh, approach to to come for this confounding or, or yes. variables I don't want to deal with. And, and yes. So I'm really glad for your questions. Uh, that is, uh, that's a very good comment. So Mike Oldham gave, of course, a lecture on the sample network function, which, uh, for example, removes outliers, but also does quantile normalization and, above all, combat. And it subtracts <coughs> out um, confounding variables. And that's exactly an example of the second approach that I just mentioned, you know. So it, it absolutely. And so that that would be in that spirit, you know. Yes. So, so Steve, I guess I would um, have be hesitant to apply the second method because I think the way you described it, and I might have misunderstood, you're going to be uh, missing all po potential interactions because when you do the residuals, unless you model interaction terms in your computation residuals, you're throwing out potential sex by disease status yes. terms, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So the truth is you probably get way more biologic insights if you don't form residuals. Why? Because imagine you find a module that relates to autism. But then you really want to know, well, does that module also relate to gender? Why? Because boys are more likely to be autistic. It would be nice if there was a gender effect. You want to say, does that module um, relate directly to ethnicity? You know. If you subtract out all these variables, you cannot ask these very biological questions. You know. Yes? One point on that. What if we also regress along with the disease status and add back the coefficient of disease status for 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do that. So the, I, the question was, wh why not also add disease status and, and then add back the coefficients for the disease status? Um, yeah, I, may, I, I don't have any opinion on it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I really have no comment on it, you know. It's, um, the reason is I never use it, so I don't want to comment on it. You know. mm -hmm. Other comments? Great. All right. We'll take a little break and um, 